Okay, we're recording now. Thank you again for Adele and Rainy and everyone. I think Stacy probably just texted me, make sure you record. Oh God, okay. <clears throat> I'm not scared, I'm not scared. Um, so one of the things I think we should begin with, which is what I think he began with, um, and I should just, I'm, 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 I always look for center lines and, you know, dominant verticals just because they're the easiest to go for. You know, we'll be able to find some interesting diagonals. And I think there's going to be, you know, the curvature, you know, some gestural curves, you know, the, the S curve that happens in his spine and the thrust of his torso with the S curve of the cornucopia with the folds in the loincloth, I mean, uh, with the angle of his um, beard, I mean, there's going to be lots of interesting stuff, but um, in time, in terms of like unifying design elements, but the, a really nice place to start in any figure, reclining or standing is, you know, establishing that center line. And a lot of times the center goes through the middle of the head. So if you just check that out, and I'm going to move up here before I even start sketching, just to prove that these artists, you know, think in these terms. So you get this like dark note, which is you know at the back of the beard, which is at, in front of the ear, um, you know, the, at the tragus, which is essentially the middle. And then you're like, is that really right? I mean, I don't really know. So if you drop it down, it hits this, the bump on the elbow. Um, but if you run up, there's like a trickling of dark notes, of speckled dark notes that run um, basically all the way through the, the like this mat, like the mass of the block up here. And then it's also going to bring us through what looks like could be pretty close to the center line of our sculpture. Um, the finger kind of angles back and then the thumb comes forward and all those other fingers come forward. So if I run this line up, you know, the center line of the um, sculpture is loosely set based on um, and certainly linked up through the, I'll just call it a sarcophagus or, you know, the base that runs through the center of his head. This is probably going to be the dominant vertical of the entire composition, believe it or not, even though, um, you know, it's not particularly loud. <coughs> um, it's kind of a long explanation for um, the first mark on the page. <clears throat> and if we can line up um, our first mark um, with his first mark, <laughs> the chances of our um, drawing being successful will probably go up uh, significantly. So part of doing these analysis is to develop uh, insights into the artist, find out their strategy so that we can then use them um, and just have good practice. <coughs> I think that mine is straight, so I must be turning it this way. I'm gonna drop it down even more so I can develop a little bit more room. It looks like I'm gonna have to go basically one-to-one -one, um, on the proportion. So if this is the center running through here, I'm gonna get the center running through mine. And then if this is the dominant vertical, the obvious dominant horizontal is gonna be the, um, the contact point with the, um, the sculpture where it you know, touches the ground. And I'm gonna run and put that in the lowest part that I can in my zoom frame. So we've got our dominant horizontal, our dominant vertical. We have our ground plane established, which is wonderful. Um, and we have our first, um, you know, linking our, our first coincidental line that I, you know, that runs through the center of his head. It's going to come through the the hand, um, through the mass of the hand, and then it's going to link up the the architecture that's behind it as well as the um, sculpture that's behind it. So that's already we're off to a good start. We've only made two marks. <laughs> oh, let me plug this in. So we don't have the incident like we did last week. Great. <clears throat> oh my gosh. Okay. So um, I have been big lately on doing the oval of the cranium. And then we're going to kind of come down through the front of the face, like the profile of the face. So the cranium, you have to look through a little bit, but the, the, the part that we're looking for is the skull that's in the back. <clears throat> and there is an angle mass 
we'll just call it a, uh, we'll call it a trapezoid for our purposes right now, two dimensionally, that helps transition the, that oval cranium um, into the, like what we're gonna call the face mask. Um, and that is probably side, you know, bangs, and then a bun in the back, you know, you know, man buns have been popular for a while, it seems like. Uh, we're gonna get the front of the face and we're gonna use that center line as the back of the beard. And we're gonna use an angle for the bottom of the beard here. We've got the forehead, very masculine brow, a little L shape for the nose, a little L shape for the septum into the upper lip and then lower lip into the chin and then the beard comes down. I um, did not do a good job as an art teacher. Um, I always do this, but I always like extend, very Syrian actually, um, the, like, the, the type of beard, how it come, the strap comes all the way across. Um, I, I didn't do it wrong. I may have made um, a little too much room. I may have made the face a little bit too long. I, I probably did. Um, we've got the line for the brow and then a little um, triangle for the um, eyes beneath the uh, beneath that brow ridge. We're going to block this in and we're going to be able to come back in and do detail. Um, my, I'm just going to have like a big head. Um, the other thing is it looks like his, um, it looks like he's got a very small head compared to his body. <clears throat> you know, like when you, when you're trying to get like this Herculean strength, um, you know, if you make the, the muscles larger, um, that's one way to go. You could also make the muscles the same and then make the head smaller. <clears throat> might be, you know, might be a lot, might be more, even, even better. <clears throat> okay. So, um, from here, we're going to go, we still have the known. We still have the, the what's going on in the, the left side of the center line. Now we got to do the back of the neck <clears throat> that comes out from the bottom of the cranium. Um, and then we can see how the, um, you know, these, unfortunately, the pit of the neck, which is oftentimes the, you know, the actual center of the figure, um, this figure is reclining. So we have to know where the pit of the neck is because that's where the start of the sternum is. So do me a favor and find the back of the beard, which we called the center. And then if you just like cut over maybe halfway between the back of the beard and the mouth, maybe the back of the corner of the eye, this is gonna be the center of the torso, meaning the, the, the you can actually see the breastbone, the uh, sternum coming down and then at the base of the sternum, once you just de develop that um, length, you build a diamond. And the diamond shape is gonna be really amazing. So the diamond gives us, um, in the way that the keystone offers the forehead, the brow ridge, the start of the nose, you know, the distance between the eyes, it's this anchor for the entire um, face. Uh, the, the sternum on that center line and then the diamond gives us this anchor for um, you know, the, rest, the rest of the torso. Um, and the, 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 the impressive component is how straight that sternum is. So we can build, there's a couple different ways of building out the um, pectorals. So we can come um, across the base of the pectorals. We can come um, angled down from you know, roughly the, the, the beard. You know, they're, gonna make, they're gonna make almost like these, you know, these almost rounded rectangles or squares <laughs> and they're just you know they're kind of or maybe a do you guys see a um an octagon i'm gonna sketch it right here um if you imagine an octagon as a stop sign and then you know with equal sides mm -hmm. with eight equal sides imagine if you change the proportion slightly um to make the t the top bottom left and right make those sides more uh, dominant and longer. And then you have these transition angles is for the stop sign. It's still an octagon. It's just, it's got irregular. And if you look up here, you have the sternum, which is this side of the octagon. Then you have the base of the diamond, which is here. Then you have the bottom of the peck that comes straight across. Then and the next angle that goes up. And then you get the long side, which is the connection between the deltoid um, you know, the side of the pec, the deltoid, and then the short one that comes up, the angle of the uh, the actual shoulder muscle, 
And then the top of the pectoralis major, which really in one sense is probably the clavicle. And I'm actually surprised he didn't emphasize the clavicle um, because it is so masculine and it's such an anchor. And, you know, and I wonder if it was because um, he didn't want moisture and water to collect in the actual sculpture itself. You know, meaning going back to the sculpture, the, the clavicle would come up here being in this impressive form. And then in order for it to stand out, you can actually feel the pit. Um, there's a gap there. And sometimes you even like come out of the water. If you're skinny enough, it'll, you know, it'll pool in there. Let me find this sculpture that we, Adele so generously sent to us. Um, the clavicle does not seem to be in, that intensely, um, you know, um, emphasized. Um, but we, I, I'm still seeing this, the sternum, which comes together, the, the gap between um, the pecs, usually you actually feel bone. You know, there's the left side connection of the pectoral into the breastbone and then the, the right side, you know, and then there's this little, you know, that you can feel the, 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 the space between them. The, this is actually, a, I feel like almost like a more feminine connection between the uh, pecs and the actual sculpture where it's just one, they both create kind of a, a line. Um, I love that you can see the contours of the stone in here carved right out of the rock. You can see the, um, you know, those are not sculpture. Those are not, um, but that, the, those contour lines at that angle are determined by the stone itself. And it's really pretty. It almost creates this, um, uh, you know, uh, Baroque diagonal, um, th you know, as a, as a kind of an uplifting piece. And I, I'm sure when they were sculpting, the artist took that into account, the nature of the stone. Okay, cool. And this is this is a long-winded way of you know drawing these this this strong chest. Um, we're gonna cut find this nice curve that runs um, not particularly long, but it comes from our diamond down to the belly button. And the the top of um, it's tough. It's tough. If you look at the sculpture here. This rim right here, that rim, I believe, is the acostal arch. What do you think about that? You got any anatomy people out there? Do you think that this ridge here is actually the bottom of the rib cage? You know, where the, um, the cartilage and the muscles attach to the, the, you know, the rib cage? I think it is. Looks and then we have muscles here, one, two, three, four, and then five, six. So when people talk about a six pack, yeah. I, you know, sometimes they're talking about you know, the, the costal arch and the abdominals. Sometimes they're talking about the abdominals, you know, two above the belly button and then two below. You know, so it almost like, like an eight pack. If you think about the two below the belly button, the two sets of abdominals above, and then the structure of the, um, the costal arch above that. Um, formally, um, we'll just stick with what, um, you know, Hubert has offered us. So the, we're looking at the, um, the bottom of our diamond. So the one part of the diamond is, is this curved rectangle for the, um, we'll just call it the, the top abdominal. And then there's a longer angled rectangle for the, for the um, next set. So it's pectoral, pectoral, abdominal, abdominal, larger abdominal, larger abdominal. Um, and then that transitions into, um, you know, the, the belly. And you can make that an oval if you wanted and then put that belly button in there as a triangle. And there's some, you know, loose skin above, you know, above the triangle leading down into what we're gonna build in as this, um, you know, the, 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 the beginning, this ridge that, def, that separates the leg from the belly, that is the hip bone. <laughs> yeah, if we, if we take, take a look at this sculpture, we do get this like really, you know, significantly loose skin. Um, and I, I mean, perhaps that helped ease the transition from smooth skin up above to the folds that are happening in the cloth. Um, not sure.
Um, there's we're, we're going to build the silhouette um, of the side of the, 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 the torso here in a second. And it seems to um, <laughs> echo the, you know, the silhouetted of the abdominals, but it's actually not. Um, it goes from the, once you draw the edge of the pec here, you're going to get the first little bubble. That's going to be the lats. Then the next little bubble is going to be the, um, excuse me. The first bubble is the um, lat, the latissimus dorsi, right. And then the next one is going to be the Yeah, I think this is, I'm sorry. It's the first bubble is going to be the trapezius, then the lats, then the um, obliques, which is basically the love handle. So the, the get this silhouette, the pectorals are in front, trapezius, what? No, it's got to be latissimus dorsi. What are the, 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 bump, the, the bumpy ones right underneath here? I don't know. Anyway, we got three. Uh, One, two. So it's the uh, latissimus dorsi, and then the. I think I'm blanking on that. And then. Transverse, maybe? I'll just, I'll just look it up. Mm -hmm. I think you meant serratus. Serratus, there's no serratus. Thank you. I looked it up. Yeah. <laughs> Good girl. intercostal muscles yeah they're that, that's they're all there um all of those muscles unfortunately are oh no i guess they're not look at that yes we get we do get some serratus um underneath you know on, on the side of the rib cage so the serratus are these like beautiful feathered like layers they're almost like woven muscles that um you know are very beautiful um when you see them and then they're also um integrated into the rib cage. So the, the ribs and then the serratus all weave in um, and they weave in and out of the rib cage as well. Um, it's a really, really beautiful set of, uh, of muscles, I think. Um, anyway, um, let's build the, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not terrified of going in. I'm actually loving going into this right arm. I almost want to get this left side arm done. Um, and it's like straight up, um, average average anatomy like you know straight you know base basic basic anatomy um so let's just get that taken care of um we're going to start from uh the the beard you know the known um we have the relationship between the beard and the the angle top of the the pecs and we're going to make this um really bubbly um you could use three lines you think about like a um the eye, eyelid of um, a Van Gogh upper eyelid. So there's the first one, first line it comes across and then down. So it's up, over, and down. And um, the the deltoid itself is kind of defined um, by the way that the um, bicep enters into it. So there's this hard arc which happens here, and that out of that arc you you're given the um, the, the beautiful egg-shaped oval of the um, biceps. So the biceps are here. You know, those are the, the beach muscles, as they say. Um, and then the underside of this block uh, is going to be trapezius. So most of the, the bicep is the dominant form. And then trapezius is this kind of shaded um, foundational bottom of the arm. Um, you get a little bubble. It's a. It's actually a concavity here at the uh, elbow, and it's a convexity. The actual elbow bone um, is the next form. So we want to have this this transition from the biceps um, into the forearm, 
um, and you get that through the elbow. And again, it, it's like, this is where you would get, you know, an IV, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a soft fleshy tissue. It's kind of like this, the space between joints. Your humans are actually relatively vulnerable there. Um, and then we're gonna build the oval for the forearm and the um, trapezoid, pyramidal trapezoid of the way the forearm transitions into the wrist. And we're gonna offer a 3D form, um, you know, coming all the way down. So the elbow, we do the egg shape for the forearm, and then that's gonna transition into the trapezoidal pyramidal um, wrist, underside being in shadow, um, the forearm being defined in the underside as a shadow, the bottom of the elbow, and then that's consistent with the bottom of the um, trapezius or the uh, uh, <clears throat> triceps. Now, the tricky thing that we've got here is that he, the guy, our, our uh, Nile River is holding, uh, you know, a dagger. And then that dagger is being turned back on itself <clears throat> to, you know, puncture the vein um, and then let him flow all of his life giving energy. Um, in the entire region. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a really unique position um, in almost like not necessarily a suicidal fashion, but like a bloodletting, an actual bloodletting, you know, um, uh, offering, you know, the, the river offering its life, um, you know, to the people. It's, it's, it's awesome. Um, and <clears throat> we have to, um, I'm going to, I might actually even zoom in on this hand and as long as we're kind of ready for it, I'm going to have to go like this. No, how don't I do it? Oh, I'll do it this way. We'll leave everybody in the right position. I'll just do a, a, a quick zoom in sketch. And I'll, and I'll repeat it. <clears throat> so there's a little sketch pad. I did uh, re-up on some paper. <laughs> it feels so good. It feels so nice to be paper, paper rich. Just like fiat currency. It's a joke. Okay. Oh, wow, great. Yeah. All right, so I'm just gonna start our, um, I'm gonna reverse engineer it. So I have my oval <coughs> for the hand, the trapezoid for the um, wrist, and you know the tib the uh, radius and the ulna, and then it's going to go into the uh, all those muscles that I, I surmise as an egg shape for the uh, forearm, and then then we're going to go into the actual elbow, and then into the, the little concavity in here for the. There. Okay. So now, now we're now we're seeing our um, our hand, our arm, kind of in context. The just a quick review. Of course, the lines above reaching the light um, are going to be lighter, and then the ones that are at the bottom, you know, evoke a um, sense of shadow without even any toning, just by having the um, the the variation between the lines um, that are. In, you know, in the light mass versus the lines that are in the shadow mass. And zoomed in, you can kind of see that. And I think that's gonna play out very importantly in the fingers. When the fingers are gonna have, all the fingers are so similar that we've got to have a way to delineate them, um, put them where they, where, they, where they need to be. So let's just define our fingers um, and then we'll define the parts and then we'll talk about what's not a finger. Um, so we've got the index finger at the top, middle ring pinky, okay? So the nice thing about the middle finger is that it's straight. It's got a knuckle, first section, second section, and then finger tip, okay? The pinky is going to be the same way. Knuckle, um, first joint, second joint, third joint. So there's three like individual sections. Those are all basically straight. Um, the, the middle finger 
is at a little bit of an angle. So we're below looking up at it. So we're going to be able to do the knuckle to the first joint. And the, you know, that angle is up and to the right, 45 degree angle. And then the knuckle to the second joint is you know, all essentially a horizontal. And then the third joint down to the, the fingertip, um, fingernail tip um, is at another change of direction. So um, the each finger is basically like a fan. So let me go back to the, the very first um, you know, the first finger. So it's like, um, knuckle, the knuckle. Oh, that's so, he's so brilliant. All right. And, and, and it's not that it's not that the, that it's a sculptor that's brilliant and it's Hubert Robert who has the ability to distill the best angle and the most amount of information, um, in the drawing. So it's almost, it's way easier to draw the thing than it is to sculpt the thing. You have to know a lot less, but since because you're recording so much less, it's important. It's so important to record the things that are only essential. And if you do too much or too little, if it's too little, it's not going to look like a hand. If you do too much, you're going to kill it. And he he doesn't do that here. So, um, basing it off of, we should base all of the fingers off of the middle finger because the middle finger is kind of the most definitive. It goes from knuckle to first joint, first joint to second joint, and then that second joint all the way to the, the fingernail fingertip. Um, up here, the knuckle of the index finger is lost. It's hidden behind the knuckle of the uh, middle finger. And, and he uses passage in order to separate the two. So the, the pinky and the ring and the middle finger, excuse me, the ring finger and the pinky are, are basically kissing, they're touching. They're almost the same finger in, in a context. Then there's a little bit of separation between the ring finger and the middle finger. And there's gonna be this beautiful shaded triangle um, representing the separation between those two. Now there's gonna be a almost a diamond shaped separation between the ring finger, um, the middle finger and the index finger. Um, but that's not the main deviation. The main deviation is that the, the um, knuckle is almost flattened by the position of the index finger. So the, the, when you start fingers, you start from the knuckle and you go to that first joint. And the first joint is where it has the most amount um, of, loose, of loose skin. And it's you know, very clear and well-defined. So the first joint on the index finger is this dark curve. So it's coming out of a passage, meaning out of a, 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 a diffused and um, empty line. A you know, it's coming out of nothing. Um, it comes up and then makes that, so this is the first joint and it's going to the second joint. And then the second joint goes to the um, fingertip. Lovely. Uh, the, the, the thumb, we're seeing the, um, the top of the thumb and then the beginning of the thumb print. So the, the thumb on the far side of this dagger is a, is a trapezoid um, with, with curving edges. Now, um, what looks like a finger, like looks like the pinky finger that's going underneath the dagger, which wouldn't be unreasonable to, to think about it that way. That is actually the chubby fat of the hand. So mm -hmm. I, if I zoom out even on my own hand, um, from this angle, this is the pinky. And then the whole fat of the hand um, almost takes on the similar mm -hmm. size and proportion mm -hmm. you know, of a finger. And then the dagger is going to emerge out from in between that. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, not the best, not the best angle. Um, all right, so we've got the, uh, the wrist and then we've got the fat of the hand making that elbow. And then we're gonna have the pinky knuckle, the middle, uh, the ring finger knuckle, and then the knuckle of the middle finger. And because I am claiming that this middle finger is the kind of the, the, the point of um, you know, the standard that we should go off of. First joint, second joint, third joint to the uh, fingernail fingertip. Um, up from here, we're gonna get the next um, first joint to the second joint. And then we're gonna see how that second joint leads to the fingertip um, index, you know, the index finger, fingertip. <clears throat> um, I get the dagger handle. 
that comes up above. And we can make that, I don't know, we can make that a cube maybe, or maybe here. And then we'll do the trapezoidal thumb on the far side. So I made that a little bit too big. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to zoom in on that finger. When you think about a thumb, you can think about it as the, you know, the nail is up here. The front of the finger is the underside. And that's the, this is where the thumb print would be. <coughs> and it's all so rounded. Okay, so it's the form of it all. So interesting. And then that's the thumb and then it pinches in and then it turns into the, the knuckle joint. Not the best thumb I've ever drawn in my life, but it, it's still, you're seeing uh, the bottom of it that has the thumb print. You're seeing the top of it, which transitions into the, the nail, which is invisible from this angle. Then you have the side of the thumb too. So there is, you know, at least four sides of the form. And um, in our, in his drawing and our version of it, it's the top plane of that thumb um, that gets the highlight. And I, 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 it's just not, it's just not happening for me. I know that's what it is, but I just can't draw. Maybe it's too small. Um, all right, so we did index finger, we did middle finger, um, and then we're gonna go, and that, that uh, each of those, the one has a knuckle, the other has a passage knuckle. Now the um, ring finger is gonna have a knuckle, and then we're gonna get the first joint, second joint, and then the third joint into the pinky knuckle. Last knuckle, pinky knuckle, first joint, second joint. And then because it's the pinky, we can make it significantly smaller. <clears throat> so small. So the I, I just have to redraw my knuckles. One knuckle, two knuckles, and then that transitions into the fat of the hand. Um, we've got to get the dagger. And then you've got to get the space between these fingers, whether it's a line or whether it's a, a shadow gap. You know, there's a gap of, of separation between the hand and the pinky and the dagger. Um, every finger, if, we, if I go back to what I was saying before, we have the underside of the forearm, which is in shadow of the, um, the underside of the forearm leading into the wrist. And then everything else is under, is in shadow. So the fat of the hand is in a light tone. The, the finger to the knuckle on both the ring and the pinky are in shadow. The underside of the first joint on the middle finger, and then the inside of the first joint on the index finger, all in shadow. You can indicate a little bit of the side plane. I mean, I built a 3D block for the middle finger. Um, and I think that is what's gonna be helpful for, and this is the last time I'm gonna draw this thumb, but the right side of the thumb, the top of the thumb, the left side of the thumb, and then I can shade the bottom of it. We'll just call that a day. <clears throat> and I mean, I even zoomed in on this hand, which is crazy. I mean, I don't, maybe this, uh, maybe I should switch over my, my Bic pencil. Yeah. Okay. So that I was using, I was using the Mitchell School of Fine Arts pencil, which is a fine pencil. It says Mitchell School of Fine Arts on it. it doesn't <laughs> Um, the lead in these, the lead in the big pencils are better, sharper, and 
um, clearer. So I probably should have gone that route, but this one has a better eraser. <clears throat> yeah, there's a factor where the materials did work, especially with this, the scale. <clears throat> All right. Is that helpful? Yeah. Huh? Okay. I mean, it, it look, I mean, if you step back, I mean, it, it looks like it. I guess the last thing I was going to say is the, um, you know, there are some, there are some essential, <clears throat> essential dark notes um, in the, in the piece. You know, the separation between these two fingers, the underside of the knuckles, and then the spaces between. I guess the underside of the pinky, underside of the ring finger, the far side of the thumb, that goes, that's allowed to go dark. Um, I didn't realize this until I zoomed in here, but the, the dagger itself is actually penetrating the, um, the skin. So the, the dagger is a, it looks almost like an obelisk but you have the side plane and then the top plane, and then it enters into mm -hmm. the body and then disappears. And I think the blood does flow, but um, that's in the sculpture and not in the... <clears throat> what do you think? Um, this is as focused as it can be, but the, the dagger, this is the underside of the dagger. This is the side plane of the dagger. And then there's the back edge of the dagger. So it, 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 it is almost an obelisk. The question is whether this elbow support here, I think it's just an, well, I think it's just that. I think it's just an elbow support, but that could have been an opportunity to turn that into like, like flow. I'm surprised they didn't do that. So is that the same oh, angle you not. think as the drawing? No, no, no. So that's what I'm thinking. Maybe that's what they meant about the angle. Yeah, he leaves out the 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 support. There's like an elbow support here. Mm -hmm. Does he? But that, now I'm looking at. Does he leave it out? This that that elbow support might actually occur right here artistically, mm -hmm. you know, as for his own personal notation, and he mm -hmm. just turns that into the you know the architecture for the background. Oh, huh. that's that's so great. I mean, I I, I, I bet a thousand dollars that's what it is. Because why else would there be a suggestion of a three D block in <clears throat> in the exact same location? Um, of that of the of the of the elbow you know, it, mm -hmm. the block is there at the elbow yeah. just, just above just in front of the it's on the bicep in front of the elbow so that that would be the the same spot fantastic The more I turn, the more of the shadow is illuminated. Straight from me. And then I can make sure it's straight for you all. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty powerful. Um, in the sculpture though, there are some really prominent um, like nipple positions and um, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure why he did not include them, but they're, they're so vital in terms of getting oriented and, and you know it's like putting in the, the face you know you, if you're going to draw a face of any animal or any creature eyes nose mouth ears boom standard you got to get those in whether they're right or wrong they have to be in there else it's not going to look like um, a face and a torso of a male 
torso doesn't look right if it doesn't have nipples or a belly button. They're just, they're just if that tr the triangle that they create is just so essential that um, to leave them out is just it, you just can't. Which is what which and he doesn't. He just downplays it a little bit, maybe for propriety. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna crush this hand, and I've got the right pencil. I'm drawing even smaller, and then we'll finally lay this lay this to rest. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to use the corner of the hand, corner of the fat of the hand, and that's going to delightfully transition into the first uh, knuckle, which is the pinky, and then I'm going to get the next orientation of the uh, middle finger, and then from that middle finger, I can then get the, um, the ring finger, pinky, knuckle, ring finger, middle finger, and then first joint on the middle finger, Boom. Second joint on the middle finger, seeing mostly the top and a little bit of the side. And then 3D entering into the um, uh, middle finger tip. Um, having a, a, a really well established contour on that top plane allows for the um, index finger. <clears throat> allows for the index finger to come out, um, out of the passage <clears throat> and not connect, um, hitting, hiding the knuckle or just the very subtle indication of that knuckle. First joint, plane change, the second joint into the curving fingertip. Relatively uh, flat, you know, seeing that there is an underside same plane change. And then the fingertip is kind of gently holding the um, block of the dagger. So uh, from this angle, <clears throat> it's kind of clearer for me to see the, the top of the dagger, the side of the dagger. And since we've explored how it comes all the way down, enters into the, to the wrist, I've kind of been able to see that. Um, you know, the, both sides of the thumb leading into the rounded thumb tip feeling good about that. The underside of the thumb is gonna be in shadow and I can give a dark silhouette on that far side. Um, now I can check my, um, what quote unquote negative space. You know, I've got the, the shadow side of the dagger, which helps define the space between my index finger and the ring finger. Come across the middle finger, excuse me, the index finger and the middle finger. Then I come across the uh, middle finger and then I analyze the space between <clears throat> the middle finger and the ring finger. And then I'm gonna line up my knuckle, first joint, second joint, and then third joint, long fingertip. Um, the ring finger is the longest because it's the straightest, um, even though the middle finger we know is bigger. <clears throat> from this perspective, um, the ring finger is straight. And we're gonna give it his counterpart, which is the pinky, first joint, second joint and then fingertip, which is gonna be the small, probably arguably the smallest finger. <clears throat> the underside of that pinky um, is dark and then helps to throw a shadow onto the gap that is um, between the dagger and the hand itself. The triangular obelisk, it's got you know, four, three sides. Well, it's got four sides, but we're only seeing um, two sides of that dagger, the thin side plane and the broad top plane. Before that, length enters into the life-giving bloodstream of the Nile. <clears throat> totally rad. Um, I'm going to do this recap again like I did in the last one where I have a, the elbow is in shadow, the forearm transitioning into the trapezoidal wrist. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. The, there's an inverse that was probably played up in the sculpture itself where the wrist is wide and angles in on four planes, underside, side plane, and then the dagger reverses itself and starts wide and then narrows in with four planes. <clears throat> it's kind of a, a yin yang or a, you know, just a reversal of forms. 
And then I can do the fat of the hand, which is in shadow, helping ease the shape of the gap between the pinky and the, ease the contrast um, between the, the um, hole in between the dagger and the pinky and the fat of the hand. I can, you know, hide some of my sins here with proportional mistakes by shading that down, getting the entire um, bottom half of the pinky and uh, ring finger and then toning down the angled top plane of the middle finger. And then I can even shade part of the index finger and then that side plane. <clears throat> So whether it's fully visible or not, I made marks that were in every bit intentional, whether they're proportional or not. I didn't make a single mark that didn't have a recognizable identity. Um, I think I just noticed this, that this little hatch mark down here is the fat of the hand of the wrist throwing a shadow um, onto the wrist. So there's in the same way that there's a hole beneath the pinky and between the dagger, there's also a smaller um, hole and shadow between the fat of the hand and the wrist. Um, and the dagger. <clears throat> cool. That's great. It's a nice, it's just a nice, I mean, my hand is oversized. Again, the proportions matter, <clears throat> but it's the, the, as far as the, the teaching of the drawing goes, it matters more that the mark, um, every mark is accounted for and named. Yeah, awesome. <clears throat> how did everybody, how, how did everybody, is everybody done? Everybody finished that my, like a year ago? I know no. I, I drew it no. twice. I drew it twice, maybe even I explained it seven times. Um, it's gonna be really helpful having drawn that hand um, when we get to do the um, the other hand holding, holding the cornucopia. And where I was just, where I may have been unjustified in drawing a huge hand for the dagger, um, Hubert give, offers us a really big hand for the, um, holding on to that cornucopia. All right, known into the unknown. Let's go back to the, um, you know, back to our neck where there's this really wonderful tone on the back of the neck, you know, helping the, the um, beard to pop out. Um, having Better, what, what is that? Uh, is that something resting on his left shoulder or is it with a, with a like a- Here? Yeah, what is yeah. that? <clears throat> so <clears throat> from my understanding, this is a horn. So I can sketch it over here. So it's like a horn when, and horns are, I think can be hollowed out or are in fact hollow. Yeah. And, you know, so you have this like, and they can be, you know, I mean, I get, I get these things on Instagram of like, I don't know what kind of demographic I fall into, but there's a, you can get like drinking horns. They get horns that <laughs> turn into okay, drinking yeah, yeah. horns. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, steer horns and stuff. And so I think that's what this whole thing is. I think it's actually carved with uh, decor, you know, like some, it, the stone has been carved into. Okay. And then there's a, either a decorative um, arrangement of I, what I would imagine is, you know, uh, produce that Food. edible food yeah. that were that's totally. harvested and grown okay. due to the Ni the Niles <clears throat> um, you know, fertility yeah the fertility the, the fertile nature of the fertile crescent of, of everything that comes out of there so I don't know what is the, I think we should look though yeah um, at the statue and there's this type of leaf I'm going to show it over here these are the leaves that you find on like Corinthian columns. So you have oh, a triangular yeah. center and then there's these broad side uh, and then they even curl up at the ends. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And they're very decorative, they're everywhere. Okay. Um, then there's this one, which is longer and thinner, almost has like a tongue feel. You know, it's got the center, the veins that run this way. And then because it's sculpture, it has a, you know, thickness. So okay. that's the broad side. So this is the underside in shadow, top side in light, and okay. then it's throwing a deep shadow. So all of them are inside of this, you know, carved horn, okay. which I assume is a horn. And those, those leaves are kind of um, a base for maybe there's grapes in here. Maybe these are uh, berries of some kind, mm -hmm. figs. They look like they could be like sized of figs, but it's a whole 
stack. And if you look at the, the, sh the general shape of this stack, it is trapezoidal and I think it's two layers. So you get the top and then we get the, there's a first row and then there's a second row. And then this, the shape of it is you know, like kind of a trapezoid or you know a partial cone. You know, if you have the top and then these conical sides with the decorative florals coming out and then that's the capstone for the, uh, the horn. Okay. And that looks like this. Um, and I'm trying to find a, you know, a design connection to, um, you know, to the to the guy to the Nile's head too. I mean, is it like the size yeah. similar to the size of his head? Come on. Um, look at this hand though. <clears throat> this hand oh, is. That's what that's scary looking. Good, good, good. good. Um, there is a, there is like this cap, you know, at the base of the, you know, it's, it's not like it's just ends in a horn. It's got this little olive and then a little cap to the olive. The hand does look, look at the, um, look at the blocky nature of this wrist. I love that. So these are, this is the radius and the ulna right here. And then look at, this is the block of the hand. Look at that steep angle right there yeah you know, all of those bones you know that, that help move the wrist and twist the wrist so these are the bones angled back and then the hand is you know sunken in so all in here is this epic transition and i do th and i think that hubert might be straining i think a little bit with that and he could have you know could i'm not i don't want to adjust it too much at the moment but i think there could have been a deeper shadow in there who knows All right, so I think the key that we're going to have to think about is where is this cap in relationship to, um, you know, our, our Nile river god and the shoulder and the top of the, the, the you know, the, the placement of the fruit are parallel with one another. Mm -hmm. Make it like that. That's not going to work. How do you feel about that? I think that think that'll work. Yeah. Yeah, I I hope so. Let's yeah. try. Let's try it from this angle. We'll see what we'll see what um, emerges. Okay. So let's uh, well, let's go back to the you know the known. So we have the, um, the relationship between the back of the beard, center of the head, the angle of the neck, and then we'll do this little arch right here, which is trapezius in the back. I'm going to keep the trapezoid. I mean the clavicle. And this little curve up here really does make a big difference because that's going to be, I'm going to break our entire, um, you know, all of the decoration. I'm going to try and uh, minimize it and uh, generalize it. So just initially. So I have the connection between the foliage that's falling out of the top of the horn, that's overlapping the horn, and then there's the um, fruit that's resting on top of the horn. And I'm using the, the foliage that's falling over. I'm turning that just into a rectangle. And then we'll have the, the 
and like the like I said, like it's the the neck, the, the the trapezius lines right up with that, with the top of the foliage and the base of the fruit. Okay, so we've got the um, the right peck, um, which is actually the right breast, and then that the peck turns into um, the muscles underneath it leads into the armpit. So this next gorgeous S curve, um, you never really think of armpits as being beautiful, but um, on the left side, you know, it's the deltoid into the pectoral, not as attractive, um, the breast leading into the pectoral muscle, and then where the, the pectoral muscle disappears underneath this S curve of the um, armpit. It is pretty nice. All right, and then we'll have the cornucopia angled down in a very similar echo of the, um, the, the, the middle of the um, uh, abdominals. So intentionally repeat that. And then we got to find the top of the, the, the hand because the hand, and we want to make that relative to um, our sculpture. So if I, I follow the, the shelf of the top of the hand here, and I run an angle over, it's basically the bottom, it's, the, it's above the belly button, and it's kind of at the base of our second um, abdominal. So that horizontal, it dips down a little bit, and then at that thumb, this little curve of the joint of the thumb um, is pretty important. It's the highest point of the hand, and ooh, and coincidentally, it winds up on our center line. Glory day. It is a good day. Okay, so um, I've located the curve of the horn, and then I've found the round part of the thumb, and it's got to be at the right elevation, meaning at the base of the abdominal, and then it's got to be lined up on the vertical with the center of our the head of our Nile, Nile, Nile god. Um, and then the block of the hand is a rectangle that's going to be seen as an angle. And the, the block of the hand is the, from, you know, there's the, um, where the, the wrist bones and the racing all in the end. Then there's all those maybe 15 different like um, bones that are all kind of clumped together, which really defines the wrist. And then after the wrist, that's attached to the four muscles of the, the palm of the hand so there's no separation and i call it a block because just like in this case you see the broad side and then you see the um, mass of the underside that really does take on a the quality of a cute of, of a block <clears throat> so we've got the round all right that's good um well let's use a an oval for the wrist and that's the that, that's like a uh, the, the general muscle, um, the general um, bones that have been, um, when people, people say they break the wrist, there's like, it's like eight, there's like so many different bones in there that they could have broken that all have names, which I do not know. Um, but I, I knew, do know that it's, that's the transition that we're looking for um, in order to get to the um, block of the forearm. And that's where the radius and the ulna end. Um, and then we were transitioning into the hand we really need to get that arm because that's going to define the bottom of the, you know, that's, the, that's where the horn disappears behind. Um, and then we're going to be able to find the position of our Egyptian sphinx, which is going to be the, the whole reason we're drawing this thing. Uh, the sphinx will be our, uh, our dessert. <clears throat> and if you can't tell, I used a trapezoid for the, the head and the headdress. And then I'll use a rectangle or even like a, a, I guess you can still call it a trapezoid, a broad trapezoid for the, um, could be, it's, it's definitely the lion body, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that when we, we're just not quite there yet. All right. <clears throat> The wonderful thing about the hand is that it is so abbreviated. So let's look at the block of the hand and let's develop a strategy for solving the piece instead of just jumping right in. And I would always, you know, look, I, I do the block of the hand and then I look for the knuckles. 
I'm, um, I will, I will zoom in as we do this hand. I didn't realize that it was going to be such a epic hand lesson today, but it just turns out that it is, and that's fine. <clears throat> and, I'll, and I won't draw it twice. I'll just draw it right along with us here. Okay. So when you draw the block of the hand, arm, wrist, block of the hand, you got to find these knuckles and you got to find them fast. So the one big knuckle that you can see at the top is the index finger. And the index finger is going to be the, the, the star of this show. Um, then the, you get the um, important but quieter um, middle finger. Then we have a ring finger that seems to be like uh, sunken and tucked in. And then the last one is the uh, pinky finger, which is folded completely under itself. Um, and you can see that it's, you can see there's a little, see that little line right there, a little crease. It's, it's folded, it's tucked under the fat of the hand. And I think it's because it's actually holding the, 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 the um, principal under support of the cornucopia is the, the, the ring finger and the pinky, which is probably not the most secure thing ever. But if you hold, you think about you holding a, holding a football or just like holding something under your arm, your pinky naturally, I'm doing it, like the pinky naturally curls under itself. Let's check the, uh, let's check the tape. Um, same, same spirit. Um, you know, the, the, um, I like that the, you know, the, um, the index finger and the middle finger really straddle the end of the, uh, you know, of the cornucopia, which is kind of interesting, kind of suggestive. It, it's kind of supports it. He's getting oriented with it. And then the two other fingers kind of cradle it on the underside. So the, um, the thumb is wrapping around the top, the, the, um, the, um, and it's not, if you don't really, he's not, if you look up here, you look at the actual drawing, he's not achieving the, like the forcible spread of the fingers. You know, the fingers are, 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 are you know, it's almost like they want to be together, but then they're forced open by the, um, you know, by the form coming through. So it's, it's like, it's more like, it's more like this. Here, like, yeah, like that. So like you can't. I can put my fingers like this, and then the form of the the candle holder, you know, pushes them apart. And I can also support it a little bit that way too. Wow, that's great. Yep. I'm... And that's not what he gets. It's like it's he. His is is honestly, it's a little bit clumsy. So I might change the way I sketch my hand so that it fits more. <clears throat> with what I think the spirit of the sculpture actually is. So that we can still make the, the star of the show, the index finger. So we'll do first joint and then we'll do second joint. And then we'll do the um, finger, the um, last divot with the uh, fingernail tip. And then in between there, you know, is the, the horn of the cornucopia. Yeah. And then the ring finger splits first joint, second joint, and then the third, the, you know, obviously the last digit of the, the last joint, last bone, that, that tip is divided into half by the um, fingernail. And if I pull this in just for posterity, the one was going off of It doesn't fit. It's okay. Um, the horn comes down much longer. We'll do the um, olive, uh, uh, you know, the, the olive form and then a little cap. The thumb or the ring finger is going to be tucked under, holding on to it. And then so is the pinky. Little naughty. Move 
this over, move this over. Oh, I have to zoom in. Clean this up a little bit. Get the um, the rent, the thumb. Thumbs are great, and they're 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 easy. Um, they have a circular joint, and then they pinch in really nicely into um, the, the almost the elastic loose skin of the first digit of the, of the last digit of every finger, and then you have the rounded portion, which that is then divided into fingernail. So on the underside, it's curvy with a joint, kind of pinched in. Uh, I call it like a pinched hourglass. Um, and then you have this rounded sphere of that. It's almost like the, uh, it's almost like a knuckle joint of the thumb. And this is where the, you know, you get this extra skin here where the index finger happens. One, two, three. Oh, Can't see that, it's up here. Um, this is really sloppy down here. So don't pay attention to that. But this, what, this is where we're going. So we're looking for this rounded knuckle then it's going to pinch in to these first, you know, elastic joint, and there's there's more to it, um, but this is the part that we're going to see from this angle, and then it turns into that, uh, you know, the the tip of the thumb, which again I was trying to emphasize that there's a, a, a front side and then a side plane, and then a top plane, and this top plane is subdivided by the half of it being the fingernail and the other half being kind of the smooth slope leading up to all this loose skin that wiggles. Um, you can see all that extra skin in there. Um, it's abbreviated, but we get the rounded joint of the knuckle and then it concaves into the first joint, get that loose skin and then it disappears behind the hand. Um, I made these fingers way, way, way too long. <laughs> But I also made the length of the horn too long, so I kind of dig it at the moment. His hand looks very ill-defined. <laughs> very ugly. It is, yeah. Um, I don't think he loved. I don't think he loved this sculpture necessarily as much as we did. Um, I think he does love the uh, the other feet. That's see. Oh, hey, what's up, Stacy? Can you hear us? Hey. It's me. Hello. Can I, can I what? That's right. Hi, everybody. I'm in time to take some of your amazing pic pics of don't, your pics. Don't fall for it, Stephanie. She can always, <laughs> she can always hear. She can always hear. All right. So here we go. Um, yeah, all that looks good. I think I think we should just, I, I don't. I don't know how much you love the how much you love this river god, but um, whether you want to continue it next week and do the the legs or whatever, um, maybe I'll do a supplement tomorrow. Um, did anybody watch the supplement? Not yet. Okay. Um, good. I'm still a little embarrassed about <laughs> the audio the audio processing problem. Um, we've got 15 minutes left, so. I mean, I'm, I'm going to, this is the time where I'm just going to enjoy the, uh, the, you know, the icing and do this cornucopia. I'll talk the way, my way through it. Stace, you should probably do this um, because we have time. I'd love to. And all the, all the hard part was sort of the, um, the anatomy. Um, I'm sketching now. Oh, I forgot to do those obliques. I love the obliques. Someday I will. I will, those will return. When I was in uh, high school and college, all the ladies used to like that part of my anatomy. <laughs> oh, brother. Uh, they haven't, they haven't write about that. In no, your, they haven't been in seen in a long time. Well, we're not sure if they're even under there. <laughs> EMI. The, I'll, have to, I'll have to prove it. But that's why we got the Peloton. Um, so sorry, Stace. I was just trying to. Um, I was just trying to get myself in a position where we can. All I have to do is focus on the, the cornucopia and then into the little Egyptian sphinx character on the bottom because it's a little bit more free formed. 
Is that his arm that goes around the back of the cornucopia? I think so. Uh, I believe it's a, and I'm wondering if there's either a strap. There's a or, fabric. I think yeah. the sheet. Uh, yeah, great. Like, you think that's a sleeve? Like you think it's the it's the it's the his cloak that's back. Oh, hold on, let me zoom out. Yeah, that wraps it's around. Part of the, so. Yeah, it's got to be part of this that wraps around from behind. Yeah. I wonder if it even comes in. Like, I wonder if this. I wonder if it's even. If this is the side of the sphinx, or if this is actually extra fabric. I don't know if it really matters. But it's nice that we don't have to worry about the elbow fabric. Oh, let's check the. What? Who knows. Trevor, uh, oh, I think I can see it. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I don't. I just don't know. I, this angle doesn't make it very make it much clearer, unfortunately. Huh. Whoa. Wow, nice job. Maureen did a nice one. Oh, let's see. She's, uh, oh, Annie Pickles is on the plane. Great. My parents are going out to San Francisco again. Um, yeah, I don't, nice. think, I don't think Maureen would mind. Let's see. So there, it, hers. Oh, was, that's it great. From a, from a, her, it was photographed from like, a, like a, the pad was at an angle, so it's weird. Yeah. But um, yeah. The, mm. the, hand, the hand is a real victory, like real. Yeah. Victory. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. That's really that's real art. Great. Yeah, the face is nice too. We didn't even get back. I, I, we were just blocking it. We just basically blocked in the the face at that position. <laughs> see what 10 minutes will bring um all right so i've noticed there's a little uh little uh oh that could be kind of i'm not exactly sure what it is but we have the um we have the fruit call them figs you know, each one has a look like a, seemingly like a little bit of a texture to it but it's definitely round it definitely seems to be some like uh, fruit nature, like it's got a stem or, you know, where the stem had attached at one point, a couple layers, they overlap a little bit, maybe like little peach lines. Um, again, like little figs, like maybe even some gourd type of thing. Now, what I had not noticed before, and I don't know whether it's in the sculpture or not, I can, I'll check. I think it's worth it to check. Um, <clears throat> what I was saying is that there's in between the flowing there's like this little disc, there's a little transitional disc, on the, certainly on the left, possibly on the right, that transitional disc before um, we get the, uh, before the foliage kind of falls out, pours out um, of either side. And the artist, you know, Hubert, Robert does typically find the center lines and then we'll get, you know, some of the, try to get to the, almost the shorthand nature of the foliage that, that pours out. And we can, we're interpreting Hubert's interpretation of um, this, you know, classical Greek artist. I can't believe they keep the sculpture outside, but maybe it's not as old as we think, but that's all right. Mm -hmm. So I've got my, my little textures. Um, I'm creating a coloring book. So I'm not worrying about the, the space between the textures just yet. I'm looking for my, my principal elements. Um, and then I can draw the, redefine the horn, I think a little bit better. I can see that there's a stem on the carvings and a bilateral symmetrical uh, decorated side, left side, right side. And I was shading the arm 
toning that down, shading the bottom of the breast, toning that down, shading the underside of the acostal arch, and then the side plane, really even of the abdominals, and then certainly going into the serratus and the trapezius that's deep in there, um, and with tissimus dorsi rather, not trapezius, lats. Um, I'm gonna have to suggest the, um, um, I haven't been pushing this very far because the, the drawing today has practically been so much about blocking in, but you know, being able to erase your construction lines you know, when needed is gonna be important. And you know, the, the broad side of the chest, you know, where that original center line was can stay, but it doesn't have to stay forever. It's quite a chest. <laughs> and abs. Yeah. I mean, yeah, abs. <clears throat> there really is. It's a, uh, you know, I don't find the male, male figures particularly like attractive necessarily, um, but classical Greek muscle, like, like these idealized muscular forms really are just you know i think i think very very beautiful um in their uh in their idealization and you know just the, the forms mm -hmm. I mean, they actually are beautiful <clears throat> and thinking the belvedere torso yeah and mm -hmm. even i mean this is even you could argue is even he's even more swell swelled you know like he's on a herculean level Tucker? He, he does feel a lot like Zeus, actually. Because Zeus, there's like, Hercules had like all of this like overt musculature where Zeus was like strong, but he was just huge. And that's kind of what this guy is. Like he's just like a, it's just a, a large, large, large figure. Not necessarily a, um, you know, aggressively muscular, but just large. And I think the scale of the head, the size of the head uh, does that, you know, the fact that it is a little bit of a smaller head. <clears throat> so for the, for this face, um, I, I'm almost seeing the, uh, the face of our, um, sphinx. There's like the, the headdress and the, the sphinx really does, um, it's, it, it pleasantly overlaps, um, both the arm and the cornucopia. So the cornucopia horn it's nice that that is um, behind. So now we have the Sphinx's head, we have the, the wrist of the Nile, then we have the um, horn of the cornucopia, then we have the biceps that are in front of the, the um, lats. Um, so it's you know, one in front of the other, in front of the other, in front of the other, in front of the other. Um, so in a very, very short window of time, we have a lot of different elements overlapping each other and, and the, the overlapping, you know, continues, um, it's fun and, um, you know, it's usefulness, um, in the elbow as well with that fabric. <clears throat> Haven't quite got there yet. So there's the headdress. And then I assume that is like a Cobra, um, on the top of there. And then there's some stripes on the top of the headdress and then. There's um, oh, yeah. a strong uh, pair of ears. These Egyptian figures have very um, pronounced ears, whether it's the headdress that like pops them forward or whether they just felt they were aesthetic, um, you know, beautiful um, or, mm -hmm. worked be or worked better being idealized, seen more from, um, <clears throat> almost more from a frontal view. Yeah, the ears, even from the side are more seen from a frontal view. And if you think about the Egyptian head, um, you know, the being these figures being in profile, um, you wind up, you know, really seeing the ear in its idealized view from the side. And if you're looking straight at a figure, you know, how are you, the ears are attached to the side of the head, they're in foreshortening. So if you want to idealize it, you, know, you make those ears stick out on either side. I actually think that the headdress um, as it hits the shoulder and it angles down, you know, follows the roundness um, of the shoulders. I mean, I think the headdress was in fact there to probably make the ears more pronounced, but to actually double as um, auditory um, 
ac you know, accents. I mean, if you have that headdress on there, um, you will hear better with that plane. Mm -hmm. You know, it, your whole head catches more sound waves and it increases your ability to hear. You know, why, yeah, why I'm sorry. I have a natural repeat? hearing aid. What's that? Can you, re can you repeat that? I didn't hear the last, the last part. Yeah, I mean, if you put your hands up to your ears. No, I'm kidding. Head, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh my God, this <laughs> you do. I got you. you. Got me again. <laughs> I was sure you would not fall for it. No, I'm Charlie Brown, man. I'm Charlie Brown kicking the ball <laughs> every time. Charlie Brown. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, yeah, I think I think these these might I think these might come back in fashion someday, in like four hundred years. Well, it's interesting that um, aesthetically today there are people who find that unappealing and actually have ears surgically pinned back. Yeah. Right. I, when the ears don't, if you don't have the headdress on, I don't know if it, I don't know if it works as well. Yeah, I, I was, I had a friend who did that. You know, it's interesting over time, generations and yeah. what is and is not appealing change can change so. Oh yeah. So drastically. Yes, indeed. Um, I, yeah, let's see. I wonder, a lot of times these sphinxes have, you know, really pronounced breasts, like human breasts. Let me see, let me check the original. And she does not. She does not. You guys can see that, right? Yeah. Um, you've got yeah. the these lion claws that overlap the um, lip of. See how she's like kind of gripping. She's like gripping the edge of the table or the surface mm -hmm. that she's on. I actually really like that. Um, and then it goes from the wrist down to the elbow, and then it's a little bit. I, I mean, it's it's honestly it's a little bit awkward. Uh, if you look at the torso. The torso is actually very human, very natural, and then on that front plane, and then it's an awkward transition as it leads into the uh, you know the lion's body. I'm gonna abandon my. <clears throat> so when you draw these arms on here, you can you can think you can hear him thinking about it. You know, human deltoid, tricep, elbow. You know, wrist. You can you can like see the the human arm in there, but they're actually um, cat. You know, big cat. <clears throat> Overall, the light. <clears throat> you know, our light source is uh, from this direction, so it's it's from the the left and um, the side. So it's the front left. And um, I, I need that because I'm gonna come in and find all of our, uh, I'm not gonna get into the, um, you know, the, the anatomy of the legs and the gluteus medius maximus into the hips. I'm gonna leave that little part out, but I, I would like to get um, at least, um, you know, in, you know, in the next five minutes or so, I can just, uh, once, because I have my line work, you know, I have his arm disappearing into the sleeve and I can be kind of bold with these mark makings because the high contrast of the mark will all be toned down when I, you know, hit it with the shading. So um, I'll be able to shade the underside of the, and the broad side of the cornucopia can shade the side of the arm as well as the um, some of the mark making in the elbow. And then as the elbow turns under itself, it goes even darker. Um, the our left side, right side standard that we used for the um, for the torso 
also plays out um, in the sphinx where the far side of the headdress is in shadow, the far side arm in shadow, underside of the lip, underside of the chin is in shadow, and then the space between. Uh, definitely the uh, the rib cage into the obliques are in shadow and then the space between uh, is kind of no man's land, both in the sculpture and in the drawing, the space between the Sphinx and the Nile. Um, I didn't shade the hands, but the, the right side of the index finger, the hand turns under itself. There's a deep shadow in the crevice between the fingers. And then even, I bet you there's even a cast shadow from the horn. Um, the back of the hand is light, but it has some directional indications. And then as the plane changes at the wrist, it gets some shadow. And then we'll do the underside of the, with the um, forearm goes deep shadow. That's nice. I do think that, um, you know, some of the fruit and some of the foliage needs to be kind of calmed down. If you just compare the, the tone of the, of the of the cornucopia to the to the torso i mean look how much light there is on his body and how much how toned down the cornucopia is so in the spaces between yeah you can add some deep dark notes um but the overall tone of the object is going to be darker so it's not like there isn't contrast i mean there is pop um but there is going to be more shading overall, even in the lights, especially in the lights, I should say. <clears throat> and the um, Adele brought up in the beginning, like what the what the material is, and it is a it is a, a sanguine, you know, so it's a red chalk. And the, the the wonderful thing about the red chalk is that it is it exists on the higher end of the value range. So the darkest it can go, look underneath the foot here, you know, the underside, you know, the deepest darks and the crevice of the finger in between. The darkest that goes is maybe a seven, uh, you know, a six or a seven on the value scale. And you have to really work to get there. So um, it's generally a lighter. Um, and even the pen, even our pencil can get to like an eight, a seven, an eight, a nine. Um, and you know, it just makes, you know, the pencil is just capable of making darker marks. Um, and in a way, sometimes you want to limit yourself to how dark you can go. I think because graphite is so, it's so temptingly close to being capable of doing what charcoal does, that you kind of want it to go darker. Where the sanguine, it, it, from the beginning, you know it can't do that. So then, you know, you don't even try. Thank you, Trevor. Oh. I'm going to head out. Okay. Um, Stephanie, can we see your piece? Oh, sure. Sure. Um, get let's see. Back again. Uh, let's see. Switch camera. Okay. Are you sharing? Are we... Yeah, let's, let's have a look. I just want to put this. Whoa. Can you move that a little to the... Uh, keep going. Over, 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 and back a little bit toward you. Yep, you got it. And freeze it. Yeah, but yeah, freeze it there. Nice. Hold it, hold it for like eight seconds if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. I have to um, I have to figure out how to pin you. But then as soon as I stop the share, it, all these other windows come up. Okay, add pin. Oh no. Yeah, that's great. I love his abs. <laughs> I mean, his, mu his muscular, the musculature is so nice. Yeah. yeah. Discovering new frontiers of flesh. <laughs> <laughs> and the fabric draped over his legs. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. really. Yeah, it looks wonderful. Thanks. All right, thanks. So, beautiful. Okay. Um, yeah, and I will, I, I should have done, the, I should have come back into the face a little bit more because my face is unresolved. Maybe in the beginning of class next week, um, we can hit that. Um, Mary, can we see yours? Okay. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, little, yeah. a little bit more, yep, freeze that, if you will. Very nice. That's beautiful. Love the foot. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, still went up, I went up into the upper part. I'm, I'm glad. Um, the one thing that gave me a little uh, moment of uh, pause was the position of his belly button. If you look at the whole width or height of the abdomen from bottom to top, try to run it along the vertical. And I think the mm -hmm. belly button is going to be higher. It's going to be closer. I think to you're right. Before shortening. But that, that yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It was the only thing that stood out as being, um, you know, and, and it's an easy correction too. Um, great. Yes, it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Adele, are you, you're up next on my, on my feed. Okay. Cool sweatshirt. Yeah. Um, mm. and if you mm. Wow. Right there. Oh, very nice shape. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah he's got. He's got. He's got. He's got all the stuff. He's got all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. These are beautiful. That hand. That hand lesson was really good. But yeah. Even tiny was difficult. <laughs> so yeah. small. So small. And it, yeah, it's. And that's the thing when even when you're going even when you're going big or small even in the small it's not like you it's not like you think about less you you make yeah. smaller marks you record less but you don't understand it any less than if you're doing a full-blown hand almost so um all right grace i got you up next well i missed an amazing class yeah it was a very good class stace i told you it was going to be oh a, wow a i know that's fabulous that oh, scale wow. is great. great. Really looks, like, it. looks like he's taking a selfie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, like a, oh, yeah. it's really good. It's really, really Lovely. good. I did not realize that. It looks exactly like he's taking a selfie. That is so funny. <laughs> yeah. Can we see yours once again, Trevor? <laughs> Who? Me? Yes. Oh, great. I think I can put mine up. I don't have a picture of yours. I can take a picture on my thing. I, I wish my phone, I wish my iPad is linked to my phone somehow. I mean, it looks good. It's going to look way better when I get the face in there. He looks like the, have you seen that old Assyrian mask with the holes being cut out? Yeah, of his face? yeah. Yeah, that's great. These are these are really these are great. This this page is like is uh, bronze. Hold on, let me just find this. Video. This isn't the one I was thinking of, but it's the same thing. But like there have a yeah. ah, love that. Yeah. There's, oh, one where, right. there's one where it's like ripped, like the part of the um, eye socket is like ripped out. Yeah. This is the one. These are fabulous. Doesn't my guy, doesn't my guy like like fit that? I mean, he's got the yeah yeah, yeah. The trapezoidal headdress. I mean, this man. Yeah. It may, yeah, it may it may actually be that. You know what I mean? The bun in the back. Let me yes. See the, we can kind of re-examine the portrait of their. Yeah, he's a little, I mean, he's, he's got more of a Greek flair, but still, um, maybe not that far off. I got to find out more about this sculpture itself, actually, you know, <laughs> what country that's from. <clears throat> okay. Well, we started 10 minutes late and we're ending 11 mm. minutes. Well, I guess it was 15 minutes. Stace, you missed, you missed the, uh, the contest. I know. You, Maureen what won contest? A, Maureen won a camera. <laughs> Somebody won a million dollars. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. I needed that for today. <laughs> can, I, can I show? Can I show you a funny meme? I'm going because yeah. I'm going. I'm going. I think I'm, I'm thinking about doing this for myself. Um, it's a. Uh, it's so funny. Well, it was so so Big brief, practice. but I'm so glad I got to see you all today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Where did he go? Is this it? That's not it. That's not it. So many good ones. 
<laughs> it's a picture of this guy who's um he posted a picture of himself and he said that he won an all expense hunting pit. He's like, he, he, his, this company thanks. Here it is. Here it is. It goes, uh, congratulations, Jonathan Warrington for being employee of the month. Jonathan will get a three day and night expense paid hunting trip, fishing trip to Arkansas for his hard work. And, it, and the company is uh, complete termite and pest control. <laughs> and the, this is the dude. He's like, uh, you know, he's like, you know. Um, he takes his job seriously. <laughs> yeah. And then it, the, oh, it's my brother. <laughs> it's my brother. He owns his own company. He's, he's, the the only. Only, he's literally the only employee. <laughs> I love it. That's um, cute. Epic, this guy's the guy's legend, legend. So I think I'm thinking about giving myself a, uh, a an all expense paint painting residency, yeah, in uh, Western New York and Chautauqua for all of my, my dedicated service to the Mitchell School of Fine Arts. Yeah. There you go, you earned it. Oh, well, yes. Um, I well, we'll think, we'll all be coming to the ceremony. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Maybe I'll make. Maybe I'll have a trophy made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The unveiling. Well, I had a, I had a perfect record of being on time every class, <clears throat> and then I just broke it today. So maybe I don't really deserve it. Oh, <laughs> Trevor, we'll knock that one off the yeah. Okay, the ledger. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank All right. you. All right, guys. See everybody. See you later. Have a Bye. Nice day. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.